And I think if we're able to demonstrate, in fact, that this does demonstrate improvements in metabolic health, improvements in clinical symptomatology, um, that what that allows us to do is to speak to clinicians who work with youth and say, this should be a tool in your toolbox. Emerging research is telling us a lot about ketogenic interventions for bipolar disorder, but what about in the pediatric population? Well, there are two different studies that are ongoing right now that are probably going to shed a lot of light about using ketogenic interventions specifically for pediatrics. And given the history of ketogenic interventions for epilepsy, there's really quite a track record about using it for brain-based disorders. So how is this going to be different? What's it going to add to the current framework of using ketogenic interventions? Let's hear from Dr. Kirk Nyland. Welcome to Metabolic Mind, a nonprofit initiative of Bazooki Group, transforming the study and treatment of mental disorders by exploring the connection between metabolism and brain health. Thank you for joining us on this journey. All right, Dr. Kirk Nyland, welcome to Metabolic Mind. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Brett. Yeah, I mean, it's a pleasure to, to interview you always and to speak with you. We work together closely at, at Bazooki Group, um, but... Um, now I get the chance to talk to you about some some studies that you're you're helping sort of facilitate, and uh, you know as I've talked to you about before, you're, you're and really appreciate about you is that you're really focused on um, where the gaps in research, where the gaps in science, and one of them is with with children, with the pediatric population. So we have a couple big efforts to talk about with bipolar in the pediatric population and ketogenic interventions that I'm really excited to get into. But but before we do that, you know, once again, just bring us up to speed, your, your quick background, um, and then we'll get into the details. Sure. Um, so my background, I did my, my PhD at the University of Toronto in neuropharmacology. I studied the ketogenic diet in epilepsy. And one of the things that we'll talk about is the irony of the ketogenic diet predominantly being used in a pediatric population in epilepsy, um, but we don't really know um, the answers to those questions in, in, in bipolar. Um, after completing my PhD, I worked at the Ontario Brain Institute, where I led the research and informatics programs there, and then had the good fortune of getting to meet Jan at a conference and learning about the work of the Suki Group and having the opportunity to continue my, um, my interest in ketogenic diet in a different in a different area. And this is, of course, in serious mental illness. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think what's really germane to this dis discussion is the sort of the historical knowledge of ketogenic interventions in epilepsy, because it's seen by many as sort of like a quote unquote new intervention, but in the field of psychiatry. Um, and as, you know, Dr. Chris Palmer and many others have said, no, it's, it's not a new intervention because it's been used for epilepsy for decades, if not century, if not a century, you know, um, with decades of study behind it. Um, but the first question is always, is it safe, right? Okay, we'll talk about efficacy, we'll talk about mechanisms, but when you're talking about an intervention in, in kids, you know, is it safe? So how do you reflect on that question and, and you know, using your experience and your, your personal experience as well with, with epilepsy and, and ketogenic interventions about the safety? So for me, I ended up starting to study epilepsy just um, out of a fascination of how neurons worked and how neurons connected to one another and how learning and memory um, took place. Um, it became very personal for me early in my, in my grad school. My nephew was diagnosed with epilepsy. And despite getting surgery and trying basically all the medications that were available to try, they were not able to control his seizures. At the time, I was working at the Hospital for Sick Children, uh, doing research uh, and at the University of Toronto. And so I was able to help bring my nephew to sick kids, where my sister learned how to administer the ketogenic diet for her son. And this was completely revolutionary in his health. He, they saw immediate effects in the first week, started to see him paying more attention, cognitively being more present. Um, he was, you know, three years old. So um, you notice these things in small children. And then his seizures stopped completely. And one of the things that really blew my mind was there was no drug on the market that was able to stop his seizures, but changing his diet can stop his seizures. And the profoundness of that realization that we could be using food as medicine, and that you could think about dialing back the diet or dialing up the diet, depending on the need and depending on the condition, was really fascinating. And it, it shaped um, the research work I was doing, looking at the effects of the ketogenic diet in epilepsy and how it works on energy in the brain. So looking at mitochondrial health, 
uh, and really led to what's become my, my full career of looking at how diet can be used to treat different neurological conditions, including psychiatric conditions. Yeah. So, so from that personal journey, you know, dug in even deeper to the use of ketogenic interventions. And so if someone questions their safety, how, how do you respond to that? You know, I think in healthcare, um, the intervention and the risk associated with it needs to be proportional to the risk of the condition itself. And I know in kids with epilepsy, the ketogenic diet that's used is a very restrictive ketogenic diet. It's four parts fat to one part combined carbohydrate and protein. They often calorie restrict the children, so they're they're getting you know twenty five percent fewer calories than than would otherwise be be consumed by kids their age. And there's issues. The kids don't grow well. They often have um, abnormal blood lipid profiles. There are risks associated with it, but the denominator is having a hundred seizures a week. And so in that case, you know it makes a lot of sense. I think. In serious mental illness, in the space we're talking about, we're talking about using a much less restrictive ketogenic diet. The studies that we support are using a two to one, two and a half to one ketogenic diet. You're not drinking cups of oil, you're having avocado in your salad. So I think there, you know, there's a big difference in when you think about it from a risk profile and a safety profile. Yeah, and I think the, the amount of protein um, is, is a big factor as well because with that traditional four to one diet, it's also a very low protein diet with for a growing individual is, is crucial. I mean, you need your protein. So, so this more, or sorry, less restrictive, more flexible, higher protein ketogenic diet. What I think of is just sort of like the modern keto diet. Basically it's been called modified Atkins in different terms, but it's really just sort of like the, the common keto diet now, which is, um, certainly much more sustainable. Um, so with that definition, uh, you know, the different definitions and with the background of treating epilepsy. So now um, there is a child bipolar network study that you were involved in help facilitate. So tell us about that. Sure. So this is a study being led out of UCLA by Dr. David Mikowitz. Um, and it involves three other sites. So the child bipolar network includes um, UCLA, the University of C Cincinnati School of Medicine, University of Colorado Medical Campus, and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So those four sites are all involved in this randomized control trial. So it's a randomized control trial, which means there's two arms and people will be assigned to either the intervention arm, which is the ketogenic diet plus uh, standard of care, or the American Heart Association diet plus standard of care. And they'll be on the, on the diet intervention for a total of 16 weeks. Yeah, and this is really sort of one of the first of its kind in this in this patient population. Um, and I think it's so interesting that, you know, the, to, to say, okay, we have the result in adults and will it translate to the same result in kids? Because, you know, they're not the same. Maybe the mechanisms of their psychiatric symptoms aren't the same. Maybe, you know, the response to ketosis won't exactly be the same. Um, and also the feasibility may not be the same. So, um, what are some of the outcomes that they're measuring to try and, you know, detect all these signals? Yeah, the studies that has three outcomes that they're looking at. One is looking at adherence and safety. We don't know a lot about um, the use of ketogenic diet in young people with serious mental illness, or in this case, bipolar disorder, right? We know a lot about the ketogenic diet in young people with epilepsy, um, but this is a bit different. The condition itself uh, affects how people relate to their families, how they relate to their social networks, and, and just sort of in society in general adding a big change like fundamentally changing a diet is an unknown. Uh, these are young individuals, so they're between ages of 12 and 19. So their family is also a factor. Is the family going to eat keto or are they preparing just special meals for the kid? Um, it has a, an effect in a dynamic both in the family as well as in school and in, in you know, kind of broader social life. And we don't really understand you know, how that affects things like adherence. So that's a really important, really important part of it. Another outcome, of course, is looking at symptom improvement. Do these individuals' symptoms improve over time being on the ketogenic diet as compared to being on the American Heart Association diet? And then lastly, they're looking at changes to metabolic health. So even apart from changes in bipolar symptomatology, do they see changes in things like BMI, insulin resistance, inflammatory markers, cognitive performance? So they'll be looking at these three outcomes across the study. Yeah, and that, that last point is so important because, you know, emerging evidence has clearly shown the increased risk of, um, you know, poor outcomes 
from metabolic consequences. So people with bipolar disorder um, actually dying from metabolic related diseases more often than the general population. So addressing that risk early in, in youth seems like it could be a very important intervention. So I'm glad they're measuring that as well. And I like that it's in four sites. So if you don't live in LA by UCLA, you can still take part in it. So you said it was um, UCLA, Pittsburgh, Denver, and what was the fourth site? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Yeah, very good. So yeah, I like how it, it, it it's very broad. Now, you know, that is the traditional randomized control trial um, that will be published and, you know, run out of research institutions. But there's other type of data, quote unquote, you know, research, quote unquote, that doesn't quite fit that that category that, that you also help facilitate through the CMHRC, which is a very different kind of intervention and measuring of data. Um, so tell us a little bit about that as well and how that addresses um, the, the gaps in, in, in pediatric bipolar research. Sure. So the CMHRC is the Children's Mental Health Resource Center. It's a national non-for-profit that provides service and support to families that have a member with, with a mental illness. Uh, it's a really, really fabulous organization. It's run uh, by a woman named Elizabeth Errico, and her um, research partner in crime here is a woman named Jana Cup. And together, they've asked themselves, they've, they've noticed that, you know, these families that have a child with a serious mental illness really struggle. And they're always looking for ways to help improve um, their outcomes, their quality of life, better help support them. And they've seen some of the work being done around ketogenic diet and bipolar, and they really wanted to make this available to their constituents. And so this is really a pilot study. It's a very small pilot study starting with five families, although they've, they've already passed the five family mark and are look to be recruiting closer to 10 families now, which speaks to the, the personalities and the ambition of, the, of those involved and their desire to help people. Um, there's a two week baseline period where they're gonna be measuring uh, people's metabolic health, uh, health in general, just to make sure that um, things are stable and, they're, and that they're appropriate for a ketogenic diet intervention. And then they're going to train the family and the individuals around ketogenic therapy. And it's a six-month ketogenic diet segment that these indiv individuals will be following. I would say, although they're collecting research data and there's definitely going to be an evidence-generating uh, manuscript writing component of this, this is really them just wanting to deliver a service for a community that has a need. And by embedding research in that process, we call it a learning health system, they can learn the conditions under which it's, it's effective or it's not effective. And they're doing some really interesting work. There's the, there's the expected quantitative pieces like blood ketones and insulin resistance and blood lipid biomarkers and so on. But it's the qualitative piece that I think they're gonna learn the most from. You know, when, you, when you're working with individuals between the ages of 9 and 17, um, there's other dynamics at play, like I mentioned before. There's the family dynamics, there's school dynamics, there's social network dynamics. How do those things factor into adherence to a ketogenic diet? Are there different ways of sort of gamifying it so that kids can feel like they can engage in those structures effectively in social structures and in family structures? while still being adherent to their diet. And I think they're gonna be learning a lot about what works, what doesn't work, how families approach it to help support their loved one. Um, so I think there's gonna be a lot of really, really deep learning coming out of this really interesting study. Yeah, I think that is gonna be really interesting. And you can get some of that in, you know, in a university-based academic institution, RCT, but not to the gr degree that you can with some of this more kind of quote unquote real world data. Um, without sort of the confines of a research institution and six months. I mean, six months is, is a very long time in, in terms of the, a study of collecting data and following somebody um, for this type of intervention. So I think it's going to be very eye-opening. And, and I mean, how many parents are out there saying, you know, could this be an intervention for my child? Um, you know, is it safe? Is it effective? How do I do it? What are what are the tricks to to get them to be more adherent and to have a better outcome? These are all questions that we have little signals on here and there, but to try and get a little more a stronger signal on is is so important. Um, so you said they've enrolled five so far, and they're they're continuing to enroll, and they're nationwide, are they not? They're nationwide. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we can definitely include a link um, to them as well. So, I mean, you've had a, a, a big hand in helping facilitate both of these studies. Um, 
and that are going to generate really um, sort of groundbreaking data on pediatric bipolar and ketogenic intervention. So what do you, what do you see, you know, for the future in this field or, or maybe future studies or, or the um, ability to start, you know, offering it now as a treatment option? Yeah. I mean, I, this is a missing piece of the puzzle for us, understanding how the ketogenic diet whether it can be effective and issues around adherence in the younger population. I think that's absolutely critical. And it's just such a pleasure to get to work with Dr. Mikulitz and the team at um, CMHRC on, on the work that they're doing. They bring such passion uh, to the project. They really are doing this because they believe in their hearts that this is going to make a big difference for people. And I think if we're able to demonstrate, in fact, that this does demonstrate improvements in metabolic health, improvements in clinical symptomatology, um, that what that allows us to do is to speak to clinicians who work with youth and say, this should be a tool in your toolbox. Yes, there's more research to be done. Yes, we need to understand things even at a larger scale than what we've already done them. Um, but it's a promising tool that we, we have 100 years of history on clinically that we think should be in the toolbox as, you know, as you're working with individuals that have serious mental illness, and as you're discovering what's working, what's not working, this is another option that could be an incredibly powerful tool for to use. And I think doing studies like this really helps us craft that narrative and be able to say that to clinicians, um, that we're not, you know, shooting in the dark here. We actually have some data. We understand, you know, what the risks and what the potential benefits are. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, going over those important studies with us. And I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. And of course, um, you can always find more about you and our work at metabolicmind.org. So thanks again. Thanks for having me, Brett. Always a pleasure. I want to take a brief moment to let our practitioners know about a couple of fantastic free CME courses developed in partnership with Bazooki Group by Dr. Georgia Ede and Dr. Chris Palmer. Both of these free CME sessions provide excellent insight on incorporating metabolic therapies for mental illness into your practice. They are approved for AMA Category 1 credits, CNE nursing credit hours, and continuing education credits for psychologists, and they're completely free of charge on mycme.com. There's a link in the description. I highly recommend you check them both out.